thank you all for attending. Um, my name is Danielle Snowflack, and I am the Director of Education, Professional Development, and Outreach at the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, or ASBNB. The ASBNB is a nonprofit scientific and educational organization with over 1,200 members. Founded in 1906, the Society is based in Rockville, Maryland, and publishes the Journal of Biological Chemistry, Molecular and Cellular Proteomics, and the Journal of Lipid Research. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is inside a faculty search committee, and it is hosted by the ASBMB Education and Professional Development Committee. Uh, if you are having problems connecting to the webinar audio through your computer, you can connect via phone at the number in the chat box. If you connect via phone, you must mute your phone throughout the entirety of the webinar. All phone users can be heard within the webinar suite, and we'll have extreme difficulty delivering the webinar to all the participants if we have that background noise. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to direct you to a few features in the webinar room. First, you'll notice there are two polls at the bottom of the screen. These polls will give us information about your career stage and goals, which will help us cover topics that are most important to you in our discussions today. Second, throughout the presentation today, we will be accepting questions. We want this to be an interactive session uh, for you all. So you can submit a question through the question and answer box at the bottom right of your screen. We will attempt to address the questions throughout the webinar. In the interest of time, we may find that we need to hold some questions until the end of the webinar. So um, we are going to provide time at the end of the uh, session to answer previ previously submitted questions, as well as new questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so with that, um, is everybody um, doing OK with the, with the audio? Great. Um, so let's get started. Today we are here to discuss the faculty job hiring process from the perspective of a search committee. We have speakers from different types of institutions, both research intensive and teaching intensive, to get you thinking about your faculty application package as if you were on the search committee. So first I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Nathan Vanderford, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Toxicology and Cancer Biology at the University of Kentucky. He's also a member of the ASBMB Education and Professional Development Committee. Nathan? Thank you, Danielle. As Danielle said, I'm a faculty member at the University of Kentucky uh, in the Department of Toxicology and Cancer Biology, which is in the College of Medicine. I also have uh, several administrative uh, positions that I hold in the Cancer Center. I'm Assistant Director for Research for the Cancer Center, and I'm a, a Director of Administration for a Center on Cancer Metabolism here at the University. So I, I have a, a, a pretty broad um, swath of experience in, related to faculty hiring. I've been involved in faculty hiring directly within my department, but also here within the Cancer Center where, where I've been involved uh, since 2009 in hiring over two dozen faculty members uh, ranging from basic scientists, uh, clinical translational scientists, uh, and population behavioral science. Uh, faculty members uh, at all levels, at all academic uh, uh, levels, um, including assistant professors. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dorothy Larratt, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Cell Biology at Emory University School of Medicine. Dorothy? Hi. Thanks, Danielle. And thank you and ASPMB for organizing this webinar. Um, as Danielle said, I'm an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine, uh, where I work in the Department of Cell Biology. And my perspective comes from a recent hire. Um, I myself went on a national job search in 2015 and was recruited to Emory in 2016. And since that time, I've had the opportunity to see the other side of a faculty search um, and by being on three different search committees. Most recently, we just wrapped up um, two committees that I was on. I'm happy to say they were both successful, and we recruited a few new faculty to Emory. And so I'm looking forward to answering all of your questions. Thank you, Dorothy. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Richard Singerstar, who is a professor, currently a professor of chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and Physics at Clayton State University. Rich? Uh, thank you, Danielle. Um, I come with a very different perspective from uh, our first two panelists. Um, I am at an undergraduate institution uh, where I have been for 10 years, 
and I have served on numerous committees uh, in both biology and chemistry, hiring uh, faculty. Um, being at an undergraduate institution, we primarily hire assistant professors, um, but I've also done lecture searches and uh, part-time faculty searches for people that are looking to get their uh, foot in the door. Um, so lots of different experiences, uh, depending on what sort of um, kind of job application people are looking for, um, what type of job. So I also look forward to answering questions from a very different perspective. Thank you so much, Rich. With that, I'd like to turn the discussion over to the panel. Each panelist will provide their perspective on what the search committee looks for in your application package and what really makes candidates stand out. Nathan, would you like to begin? Absolutely. Thank you, Danielle. So uh, a couple things. Uh, Danielle, I'm not sure if, if uh, people that are tuning in, can they see the, the answers to the polls? Questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so they can see the answers to the polls. Everyone who is currently um, logged in will, should be able to see the broadcast results. If, if that is not true, um, please let me know in the chat box. Okay, so it's it's very interesting to me. Uh, the majority of, of respondents are, are interested in uh, faculty positions at research in, uh, intensive uh, colleges or universities, which Dorothy and I can speak to. And then the next uh, most frequently answered uh, response is at a PUI, so Rich can speak to that. And then in terms of uh, where you are in your job search, many of you are, are looking, uh, just kind of looking around at career options and some of you are on the job market now. So I think what we'll have to tell you today will be very informative to, to all of you in these categories. So what I want to do in the next couple minutes is just give you some very broad uh, considerations, and then uh, Dorothy and Rich are going to get into more specifics about uh, job application packets and things. Um, when, when we're starting this conversation, I, th I think we're starting at a level that we assume that uh, people already sort of have the credentials that would be required to apply for a faculty position. Uh, and, you know, during the Q&A and the discussion, we can talk more about these credentials. Uh, this would include, you know, some level of, of publications, um, some number of publications, maybe some funding, fellowship funding, or career development, K award funding, some teaching experience, mix of all these, depending on what kind of faculty position you're applying to, uh, and again, we'll, we'll, we can get into this more during the discussion, um, but to, to beyond that, some things to consider very generally. So in my experience, some of the most successful uh, faculty hiring processes that we've gone through, uh, really there's four things that have, uh, that have really happened very well, uh, and these are uh, all kind of culminate in networking fit, which I'll describe, um, level of independence versus collabor collaborative nature of a potential hire, uh, and the plan of a, of a hire. So I'll, I'll go into each of these in a bit of detail. So by networking, uh, we all know what networking is. It, it really is important in any kind of career path you pursue. Um, for us, uh, our hiring has worked very well when uh, our faculty uh, have known others who are looking for jobs at other institutions, whether that's postdocs or other faculty members at different levels that are looking to move institutions. Um, so, you know, as, as uh, potential assistant professors, I think what you want to do is you want to not only network with people outside of your university, but also network with people, other faculty within your department and other departments that you may interact with at your current institution because ultimately those faculty members are going to know other faculty at other uh, institutions uh, who may be looking uh, to hire someone like you. So networking is critically important. Uh, other things you can do, you'll, you'll start to become known uh, through your publications and maybe through conference talks that you might give. Um, but just even when you go to meetings, meet as many other faculty as you possibly can. Uh, and talk with those people, engage interest, um, you know, in terms of, of potential hiring in the next six months, year, whatever time frame you're on. Uh, so networking, critically important. Next is fit. So by fit, I mean many times departments 
these days are looking to hire very specific types of individuals that fit a certain research niche or have a particular new technology or method that they use uh, that can synergize uh, or complement work that's already going on within the department or the institution. So be aware of these things uh, as you look for a faculty position. Make sure you really dive deeply into uh, what the department is all about that you're applying to, what opportunities might exist for how you might fit a particular niche or complement other work that's going on. And make sure you highlight that in your cover letter, research statement, those kinds of things. Uh, and Dorothy's going to talk more about that uh, in just a bit, probably. Next, uh, in terms of independence versus and or collaboration, um, it, it's very important in most fields uh, to establish a uh, independent research program for faculty. Uh, th that may not be true in some disciplines, uh, biostats, bioinformatics. While there still is some level of independence required, th they're also naturally uh, collaborative and there's a, a, an expectation of collaboration. But more and more these days, um, there's a big surge in uh, team science, uh, which is kind of a buzzword, but it, it really is true, particularly in certain areas. Uh, the cancer area right now, collaboration is huge, uh, not only to advance the work, the research that's done, but also for funding opportunities, um, institutional opportunities. There's a focus on collaborative work. So as you apply uh, for a job, be aware of this and uh, in your research statement, address your independence, but also plans on how you'll collaborate with um, others at, at the institution that you would go to and also others um, maybe back at your old institution or nationally, internationally. Even. And then that gets me to plan. So uh, again, your research statement will, will talk about the research you've done, um, and then you also need to articulate a short and long-term plan in terms of you know, what you're going to publish, when you're going to publish it, uh, where you might publish that work, and then a plan for obtaining extramural funding. Um, and then what's also really important, uh, I think, particularly here and uh, probably elsewhere, uh, Dorothy and Rich can speak to this, but incorporate within your plan plans to be mentored. Uh, I think mentorship is very important, and I think it's forward thinking for an applicant to think about how they'll be mentored and how receptive they'll be to mentoring, um, and maybe even in your application, identify a few people within the department that you join that you'd like to be mentored by, and I think that would, um, that would help you tailor your uh, documents to the specific job that you're applying for, which again, uh, Dorothy will speak to um, as well. So I think that's it for now, and then uh, we can circle back later, I think. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, Dorothy, would you like to speak next? Sure. That sounds good. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so just to follow up on Nathan's comments um, regarding what a uh, search committee is looking for at a research-intensive R1 university, um, so the various committees that I've sat on, the general theme um, that emerges is that a search committee is really looking for a candidate who is going to be successful and also someone who's going to be a good colleague. Um, those are the two main traits that we're looking for. And so I guess the question becomes, how do you as the applicant convey those things to the search committee? And the really the only thing that you have to go on, at least in the beginning, before you get face to face, is your application package. And so I just want to underscore how important it is to put in the time to put together a polished and um, well-edited application package. Um, and so what are we looking for? The basic parts of an uh, application package for a research intensive position are going to be um, the same. So we're looking for a succinct uh, cover letter in general, um, you want to keep this to about a page um, where you're highlighting why you're applying to this position and why you specifically are a good fit for it. Um, this is a good place for you to earmark your 
um, top accomplishments that you want to bring to the attention of the search committee. And you also want to touch upon your broad vision and goals, the, the research that you're going to incorporate into the department and how it fits in very nicely. Um, the next in, important document is really going to be your CV, which needs to be easy to read. And again, really highlighting your accomplishments. And it's not going to be a surprise, but the things we're really looking for are your publication record and any track record of funding. Um, with that said, um, there are all sorts of candidates who make it through um, our analysis of their CVs. So not everyone is the same. Um, I'm happy to answer more um, detailed questions, but basically we're looking for a consistent um, demonstrated record of productivity and some effort and success in obtaining um, extramural funding. The next most important document is of course gonna be your research plan, which um, needs to be um, coherent, succinct, thoughtful. Um, I recommend um, incorporating some figures, some data, um, preliminary data that you can share. Um, I'm happy to address more questions on that document. In general, for most um, R1 applications, the research statement that you're going to be preparing is anywhere from three to five pages, um, but uh, the job posting will tell you usually what they're looking for. Um, this is, as Nathan said, where you're going to be sure to highlight both your short-term and your long-term um, plans, because the committee wants to see that you have um, not only the foresight to know what you're going to focus on as soon as you get to um, an independent position, but also the vision of how you're going to develop that into a long-term career. And then there are other um, more institution-specific documents that you might um, be requested to supply. These could include a diversity statement, um, a teaching statement, and perhaps other documents as well. And so just generally speaking, um, I would say that broad tips that I would um, recommend is if at all possible to identify one or two mentors that you can consult. Um, and by that, I mean individuals who have recently within the last three years or so undertaken a successful job search. Um, these should be people that you feel comfortable asking any sorts of questions um, to guide you through this process. Um, again, I want to underscore that you want to give yourself ample time to write and edit and have other people read your application materials. Um, it's, it's not great when you're on a committee looking at hundreds of applications and someone is just reducing the font size to size eight to get it to fit. Um, so really put in the time to put your best application forward. Um, and then I would say it's also important to discuss with your research mentor um, your intention to go on the job market and make sure they know um, what you're planning to propose in your research plan. Um, it looks very good if both you and your research mentor can um, state explicitly in their letter and your research plan um, that your projects are yours to take and that you have consent to do that. Um, and then I just also want to reiterate something Nathan said, which is basically that everyone should know that you're on the search market. So any opportunity you have to meet someone or give a talk or a presentation, don't be shy. Just be sure to say that you're on the job market and you're excited about it. Um, and I think people will pick up on that and they'll be engaged in your science and maybe they'll want to follow through with your package. Great, thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, Rich, it's your turn. Uh, would you like to say a few words now? <laughs> sure, uh, thank you, Danielle. Um, I would just like to uh, approach this and, and reiterate what both Dorothy and Nathan have said. Um, they both said some uh, very important things that apply uh, not only to R1 institutions, but also undergraduate institutions. Um, and I think the first and most important thing that they've both said um, that also applies to an undergraduate institution um, is that make sure that your application is your best foot forward. Um, make sure you've read it, make sure that lots of other people have read it, and make sure that it's specific to the institution that you're applying. Um, I know Nathan mentioned fit and was, was talking a little bit about that, and that applies to that undergraduate institution as well. Um, while we're not necessarily looking for specific researchers uh, to fill any particular research needs, um, we do look for specific teachers to fill certain disciplines. 
Um, and the quickest way to get your application uh, disregarded is to apply for a position which you don't really have training in. Um, so that's, that's one thing you want to avoid and save yourself time by not, not bothering with those positions. Um, but if you take care to focus on those positions uh, that do highlight your skills, um, then state those in that, that cover letter. Um, that's going to be the first thing that an undergraduate uh, institutions search committee is going to look at. A uh, few things that I wanted to highlight that I think you should look to do in that cover letter um, is make sure your cover letter is updated for every single job. Um, we can absolutely tell when it's a form letter that's being sent to every school under the sun. Um, and that means that you didn't really want to put a lot of effort into our job and, and that's the way it's interpreted, whether that's the way it's meant or not. Um, make sure to put some specifics. Uh, like Dorothy said, be specific about the school you're applying to. Do your homework um, on that school and highlight how you can fit with that school. Um, that goes a long way in swaying some of those committee members right from the start. And then when you're putting in your uh, statements of skills for an undergraduate institution, make sure you highlight your teaching skills. Um, we really want to focus on the teaching. Um, there's not a lot of time for research at undergraduate institutions, um, so the first thing we look at is that teaching. Um, which kind of leads me into uh, the second most important thing in your application materials for an undergraduate institution, and that is your teaching philosophy. Uh, so I know that a lot of R1 schools will ask for a teaching philosophy, uh, but they probably don't put the same weight on that as an undergraduate institution will. Um, and so just a couple things about a teaching philosophy in case you're not familiar. Um, this is where you want to talk about um, what you know about education and how you want to convey material in a classroom. Um, and it's not really something that you're going to know right off the top of your head. It's going to be something you want to take some time, think about, develop. Um, and if you've only had TA experience, that's fine. You can use that TA experience um, to write about what's important and what you've seen in the classroom and how those experiences have shaped how you want to run your classroom. Um, teaching philosophies change over time, um, and most people on search committees at undergraduate institutions recognize that. Um, and so they kind of judge them based on your experiences. Uh, but make sure that you spend some time developing that and thinking about um, how you would actually approach teaching since that's going to be one of your primary responsibilities. Uh, the second thing that uh, I wanted to say that was important is your research statement. But I want to say it in a different way than Nathan and Dorothy have talked about. Um, you don't want to spend as much uh, focus on this research statement. Uh, every person that I've ever talked to that's gotten a job at an undergraduate institution is always shocked three years in at how they had these grand plans of doing undergraduate research and they spent so much time preparing their classroom that they just didn't have enough time to work with uh, enough students to, to really get a good lab set up in those first couple of years. Um, most undergraduate institutions are going to recognize that but they still want you to try. They still want you uh, to be doing research primarily with undergrads. And so when you're crafting that research statement, it's going to be important that you do a little bit of homework about that institution and find out what sort of instrumentation they might have or what sort of lab space do they have. That way you can address, okay, these are my needs and you satisfy those needs, so I will be able to come do some research at your institution. Um, if you have any funding opportunities, um, that would be great to put in your package as well. Um, even at undergraduate institutions, money is very important. So any money that you can bring along or uh, state that you could try to obtain once you're there uh, is very, very helpful. Um, so really the focus for an undergraduate institution is going to be that cover letter and how your skills match the job that they need. You're going to need to focus heavily on that teaching statement and then also put in the research statement. Um, if you spend a lot of time talking about your research track record, how you have been very successful in research and don't talk a lot about your teaching, um, a lot of undergraduate institutions are going to be put off by that because they want a teacher, um, not necessarily a researcher. So you need all the components, um, but your focus is more going to be on the teaching at an undergraduate institution. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists for your insights. 
Um, so it's the time of the the time of the presentation where we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, you know, I'll get started. Uh, one question I hear a lot is, you know, what's the right number of applications to submit for a job search? So, you know, how many different institutions did you all target? How many do you recommend targeting? Um, and, you know, we'd love to hear your insight on that. So, uh, so this is open to all of the panelists. I'll start. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it, to me, it's just like uh, you know a student asking how long a a paper needs to be. Um, you know, it's it's as long as it takes you to get across the point you're trying to make. And I think the analogy here would be, you know, apply to as many and and all the schools that you possibly can where you think you'd be a good fit. Um, you know, if you can see yourself at that particular institution, and if they have a job opening, I think apply for it and. Um, you know, I think the best situation to be in is if you had multiple offers that you could then weigh um, and, um, you know, see which ones that would be the best fit for you and your family or whatever situation that you're in. Great. Thank you. So here's a great question, and this one is for Rich. Is a teaching postdoc useful for getting a job at a PUI? Uh, yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, I know whenever we're looking for faculty members, in fact, the last couple that we've hired um, actually have come from either a visiting professor position at an undergraduate institution where they had um, a limit on their term, so maybe one year or two years as a visiting faculty member, or they've come in with some sort of um, extra teaching experience, such as a teaching postdoc, um, where they've done one or two years focusing on that education side of things. Um, so absolutely, that would be very helpful and would definitely put you at a leg up compared to other applicants. All right, here's another great question. What are some good questions to ask faculty members if you do get an interview? So I can I can start. And it's okay. um, I think I think it depends a little bit on where you are in the process. So if you're talking about uh, initial Skype um, interview, a preliminary interview, um, it's very standard at the end that the search committee will ask the applicant if they have any questions for the search committee. At that point, you're really just getting to know each other. Um, so you might ask questions such as how many positions are available, what are the next steps in the process, when can I expect to hear from you. Um, again, always conveying your enthusiasm um, and the fact that you would be a good colleague to work with. Um, once you're on site, really, it depends on any number of factors. I think it's good to have several questions lined up, but you don't want them to seem canned. So um, reasonable questions might be um, to have the faculty tell you about the students, where they come from, um, how active are they in the lab, what kinds of positions do they go on to, what kind of mentoring is available for junior faculty, are there internal funding um, resources such as pilot grants, um, and then obviously there are research questions you could ask them based on their work, um, but you should you should consider a variety of questions and try to keep the conversation natural and positive. I, I would just add to that, make sure that you also relay an interest in the area. Um, you know, ask about the university more broadly uh, in terms of, you know, work-life balance kinds of issues. Um, you know, if you have kids, ask about school district, you know, what area to live in. Show people that you're interested um, and actually moving there. Uh, and you can do that through these kinds of questions. All right, here's another question. How much help should you expect from your advisor with your application material? And then this is open to anybody. I, I can panel. jump in and someone else can follow if they want. Um, obviously, this is going to depend <laughs> on your research mentor. Um, some people are a little more available and approachable than others. And I guess with all things, you should go to the people that you feel comfortable talking to and who are going to provide meaningful feedback. And typically this involves talking to more than one person. Yeah, I would, I would second that. Uh, make sure that as many people as possible can see your application. Um, the more people that give you feedback, the better it'll be. All right, 
another popular question is about funding and what kind of funding to have when you apply. So can you get a faculty position in a research-intensive university uh, without a K99, R00, or other career development award? So uh, I can jump. So um, and this you know, is again open it's been mm -hmm. his, historically over the past couple of years, uh, we have been much more apt to hire even assistant professors who, who are bringing funding with them. Uh, through some kind of K award uh, is the most popular. Um, but we've also hired faculty that, that don't uh, have funding that they're bringing with them. And, and we're, we're actually in the process uh, of, of going through a hiring process now, and the top candidate doesn't have funding that they would bring with them. But this goes back to fit. So the people that we've hired fit a very specific niche uh, that we're very interested in and that we see great promise and potential in. Um, and so I'd say, yes, you can, you can get a job without funding, but it's very helpful to have funding. I'd also say we've passed on people that have funding that weren't a good fit uh, for us. So it's not a guarantee, but it's helpful if mm -hmm. you have funding. Yeah, I agree with what Nathan just said. Um, I would say having transition funding, whether it's through a K or other mechanism, um, will get your application looked at. Um, but similar to Nathan's experience, we have triaged people even through Skype that, you know, they just weren't going to be a good fit. And our most recent two hires, um, one of them is bringing uh, funding um, to the university, but neither candidate has a K99. So it, you do not need one. So here's a great question. Is there anything you know now that you wish you knew when you were applying or interviewing for faculty positions? And this is open to everybody. So I, I can start. Um, so one of the things that uh, after serving on so many uh, search committees that um, I wish I would have known was to do more homework about the institution. Um, to really dig in and know what the school is about, um, who already works there. Um, like Nathan said in his introduction, um, making connections with people who know people is really helpful. Um, we've hired a faculty member here at Clayton State that actually knew me from undergrad. Um, just, you know, kind of happened serendipitously, but you never know who you might know. So really going in and, and doing your homework and, and seeing what you might know and everything you can learn about the places you're applying. I guess I would add um, something that it's along the same lines, something that I learned as I was going through the process is um, as I was getting towards the end of my interviews, I noticed that I was much more relaxed because it seemed much more routine and I was less stressed about the entire process. And so as, as much as possible, I know it's easier to say than to do, but try to be um, relaxed and the best version of yourself when you're, when you're out on the interview. Um, I think the hardest thing really is getting your foot in the door. And once you're there, it's really your chance to, to shine. And if you can be natural and have uh, meaningful conversations, I think you'll enjoy the process more. And that will, will come across as well to the search committee and others in the department. Yeah, so, so my route to where I am today doesn't really fit with this question. But what I will say, and, and uh, things that I've observed is, uh, as Dorothy said, being relaxed, being calm, cool, collected, particularly during your chalk talk. Um, I've seen many candidates totally fall apart and everything is just crashed and burned all because of the chalk talk. So if you practice nothing else, get lots of practice in doing your chalk talk um, and responding to really tough questions because things can, can fall apart. Great. Well, another popular question is publication record. Um, is it better to have, you know, fewer high impact papers or, you know, multiple uh, ex publications from, uh, you know, perhaps lower impact journals? Um, you know, I, I would like to mention, um, you know, we all do center on impact factor, 
Um, but there are a lot of other ways to look at publications as well um, that I believe many search committees are taking into account as well, such as um, you know, the age factor and the eigen factor. So don't just focus on, on you know, the, the impact factor. Focus on all the factors for your publications. Um, so Dorothy, Rich, Nathan, sure, would, I can say uh, that from would you like to continue? My experience on the committees here, um, it is not necessary to have a, um, a CNS paper, for example. It's kind of in line with, with your K99 questions. You do not need one of those. And in fact, having one is not, again, a guarantee that we're going to want to bring you in because we want to see a demonstrated continuous progress. Um, so if you just have one really high impact paper in six or seven years, that's really not going to cut it. Um, because what we are seeing is it takes a long time to publish. And also, we don't know if maybe you just fortuitously came upon this project, how much ownership do you yourself have in, um, over that project. Um, and by showing continuous publications, um, it's indicative that you'll be able to be successful on different time scales. Because also consider how long it will take for you to get your first publication um, and your first grant once you've started your own position. Um, that said, does quality versus quantity matter? It's really a balance of both. We want someone who has established a name for themselves. And generally that means that you're publishing in journals that are relevant and important to your field. Um, so I wouldn't try to get you know, minimum publishing units and just pad your CV. Uh, we want to see the total package. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, you know, I think, um, it, again, it's all about the this, this story, your, your independent research uh, program that you would build, its impact long term, um, and, and the fit that it has, you know, within the organization you join and within the field uh, going forward. And that doesn't necessarily have to come across in really high impact, uh, you know, high impact factor journals. Great. Well, um, so the next question is kind of a, you know, uh, taken from a few questions. Um, but, you know, the question is, what if you're making a tra career transition um, to try to apply for a research intensive position, either from being um, a research scientist in a research scientist position or from being a person in a PUI? So um, more of a non-traditional, um, I don't want to say non-traditional, but uh, you know, not necessarily a postdoc applying for an R1. Um, so I can position. start with uh, a little background from uh, a PUI, um, so um, only because we've lost a bunch of faculty members from PUIs to R1 institutions, um, and most of them came to the uh, PUI kind of with the idea that they weren't going to stay and that, that they were using it as a transition. Um, and to make that transition successful, um, you know, Clayton State is uh, in the greater Atlanta area and there's lots of research institutions in Atlanta. Um, and so they started making collaborations uh, for research uh, with those institutions uh, pretty much the day they walked in the door. And so it gave the students uh, at our undergraduate institution a chance to go to a research institution for some work, um, but yet it gave them the ability to have better resources, um, better instrumentation, and then they could uh, bolster their publication record a lot faster than an undergraduate institution um, and then they could make that transition. Um, so that's kind of the way a lot of them did it um, that I've seen, um, but other people can weigh in. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't have that much experience in, in this. I mean, I know uh, there was a, uh, there's a faculty member that I know of here at the university who came from industry uh, and made that kind of transition, but I, I don't have any uh, personal experience with this. I know this particular faculty member was quite successful in doing that, but again, networking was actually key for him uh, coming here. He knew lots of people here. He had worked with them in the past, um, and then, uh, you know, he was... He had lots of productivity as an industry scientist, so that, in addition to his networking, made the transition pretty smooth, and he's done well here. 
uh, but I just don't have any personal experience with that. Thank you. So one question that's also coming up is um, teaching experience um, for people who are applying to different positions. So both people who have been primarily research focused who might be looking to apply to research institutions or people who are, have been primarily research focused who are looking to move to PUIs. So how much teaching experience are you looking for um, at an R, uh, R institution where you might have you know, a 70, 30 research to teaching load or uh, at a PUI where you're going to have you know, a different uh, ratio of teaching to research response. So I, I can. Yeah. So, um, so for uh, someone, uh, we get applications all the time from uh, people who have a lot of research experience who are then applying to uh, an undergraduate institution. Um, and uh, I'll be honest, a lot of times we're skeptical. Um, and the question always comes up, is this person applying to an undergraduate institution as their fallback plan? Or are they really looking to go to an undergraduate institution to teach without experience? And if you address something like that in your cover letter and say, you know, there was a family situation, we decided to move, I want to change careers, then you've addressed um, that difference in your application material. Uh, but without addressing it, um, you definitely want to go get more teaching experience um, since undergraduate institutions are primarily teaching focused. So my, my contract is 70-30 as well. It's just my 70 is teaching. Yeah, so for, so for us, you know, um, Nathan, would either, oh. teaching is important, obviously, but, uh, you know, a lot of times assistant professor level hires that come in, especially for the first couple years, are not expected to teach much at all, really. Um, you know, the focus is really setting up the lab and, and success is really centered around research. And so uh, we really try to give hires space to be productive in research uh, because that's what's really going to make them successful as an R1 faculty member. Um, and so when we look at teaching experience for these people that we're hiring, it's not as important. I mean, it's, it's nice to see and, and particularly, you know, it helps us understand the kinds of classes they could teach and how that might fit within a particular department, but it's not nearly as important um, as, as the research focus. And if I can just add, there's, a, there's another um, consideration, which is, are you applying to um, an R1 college or are you applying to a school of medicine? Because then you have another split in the expectation for teaching where uh, most school of medicine assistant professors um, really teaching is um, done so that you can get in front of students, um, perhaps recruit some students, um, get involved in your department and various programs, but it's certainly not a um, overriding requirement other than fulfilling perhaps some tenure expectations. If you're in a college, um, then certainly teaching is gonna play a slightly bigger role um, and I agree that by specifically mentioning, um, perhaps in your cover letter or in your teaching philosophy, some classes or subject areas that you would feel comfortable um, leading discussion in um, and highlighting your mentoring experience. Again, it's not gonna uh, make or break your application, but it looks very thoughtful. Thank you everyone for your insight. Um, one question um, that multiple people are eager to hear an answer to is uh, about the chalk talk. So typical structure and format of a chalk talk and what do search committee members expect from the candidate during a search talk, uh, during a chalk talk? So um, anyone can start. Sure, so um, the know, most uh, successful Nathan, chalk like talks that I've seen, uh, you know, may seem antiquated these days and, and I don't know if everybody else will agree, but the most successful ones I've seen are the ones who still do um, either on a chalkboard or a, a whiteboard of some sort or a, 
a flip chart. We just had one, uh, a chalk talk on Tuesday, and the candidate used a flip chart with a pen and paper, and it worked well. Um, and I think you can be more interactive and, and engaging with uh, the people that are in the room by doing it this way. Um, and so the expectation is that you're going to tell the audience more about what your current research is uh, and then the direction of that research, uh, how it's going to take you over the course of the next couple years, uh, particularly related to the funding that you're going to pursue, and then your longer term uh, plans for your lab, again, around funding. But I, I think, so there was another question also about um, something about what what's the process mm -hmm. like for a hiring committee or whatever. Um, these two questions, if I was a, mm -hmm. a, a postdoc or a grad student who, were, who was interested in becoming a faculty member, most of the t time, the things that happen in a chalk talk and in a faculty hiring committee aren't really top secret. So I would go to a chair, your, your department chair, and ask if you could set in on a chalk talk. Ask if you can set in on a hiring committee meeting um, to see how things go and maybe even participate as a committee member, as a graduate or postdoc representative. Um, you know, I, I think you'll get told no in some cases, but in some cases it, you might be surprised and, and you may be able to do that. Yeah, I can um, just briefly jump in with, with a few generalities. Um, so I think it's been mentioned a few times that the CHOP Talk probably is the most single critical event that will occur if you do get an on-site visit. Um, most universities will expect you to deliver a CHOP Talk during your first visit, but not all. Some will reserve that for a second visit. Um, and so to reiterate something that Nathan was saying is you should get as much information as you can. So if you do get invited for a um, on-site visit, you should feel free to ask um, who is on the search committee? Um, what is the format of your chalk talk? Um, because different universities have different requirements. Certainly all of the chalk talks I've been on um, do not allow uh, the use of slides, for example. So you are expected to write out what other format that might be, um, to a room of people, you can ask, is the chalk talk open or is it closed? Um, all of mine have been closed, but there are universities which are open, which would allow um, fellows and students to see what goes on inside of a chalk talk. And because I think so many are closed, there is this mystery um, underlying what goes on inside the chalk talk. And that's why, um, speaking to what Rich said, it's so important to practice. And so I would gather a few um, peers who work in very different fields, um, who are more senior than you, and who are going to ask you tough, cutting questions and just get over your fears and dive in. Yeah, just, just to pick up on that, I think one of the most important things uh, when you're practicing is to make sure that you practice to a diverse audience because that search committee, um, they're not all going to be experts in exactly what you do and you're going to have to communicate that information to people that aren't experts um, who are going to have very good questions to ask. So if you can kind of mimic that by bringing in some peers that don't know exactly what you do, um, but are familiar enough to, to ask you good questions, that, that would be close to, to getting that same breakdown as a committee. And one thing I'd like to mention, um, ASBMB does provide resources for communication training. So one program that we've been running now for several years um, is the Art of Science Communication which focuses on creating a presentation without slides. So being able to come talk about your research to a diverse scientific audience without um, slides, but with going in with um, a focused, um, targeted presentation. So um, we have just closed registration for this term, um, but I've put a link in the chat box. If you'd like to sign up for more information, um, please do. Um, we have found that our participants have really uh, improved their communication skills and gotten more comfortable you know, with these sorts of presentations after taking a course. 
Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this one has been uh, asked a couple times. Uh, what advice would you give regarding the, the negotiation process if you have multiple offers um, and, trans and transitional funding? And so this can be open to anybody. So if you're um, at the negotiation stage um, and you have multiple offers, you're, you're in um, obviously a very enviable position that um, you should be very proud of that. Um, I will say that uh, you want to think carefully about how you proceed at that point because you don't want to burn bridges and you don't want to um, drag um, institutions or department chairs along on a ride. So if you're not really serious about working at a particular institution, I would say long term, it's in your best interest to be open and honest. Um, Yes, you want to negotiate the best package you can, but squeezing out an extra $10,000 at the risk of um, ostracizing some peers that are going to be influential in your career is probably not worth it. Um, so you should be informed um, what is a average standard package for a given institution. And really the only way to get those details is by um, doing some research. So if you are looking at a medical school, um, the AAMC publishes standards, for example, um, salaries, um, which is something you should look into. There are resources online with Chronicles of Higher Education where you can also look. Um, and then you should also identify a couple of recent hires. Remember those mentors I told you about and ask them, what are some of the offers that you are receiving? What does a decent package look like? Um, and I would say, yes, you should aim high, but you should also be um, reasonable because when you come to a committee with a outlandish request, we do talk about it and it raises eyebrows. Um, so you want to get what you need to be successful. And I think that's the key. You need to be able to um, explicitly um, state why you need what you're asking for. Yeah, I'll just reiterate a couple things. So one thing, particularly at the assistant professor level, is to not do not uh, pit one school against the other. Uh, make sure that you're very careful in negotiating. Uh, and and as Dorothy said, make it clear why you need the things you're asking, and not say do not say that you know school X is giving me this, so you should give it to me too. That that will not go over well. You might be able to do that as a full professor, uh, but you're not there yet. So uh, you don't want to tick off the school that you may really want to go to. Um, and again, as Dorothy said, I would also reiterate, seek out people who, who are freshly minted assistant professors and get their advice. Go over your offer with them specifically, um, and they'll have some really uh, good insights into your offer and how you might be able to to navigate getting something else or or increasing whatever. But but don't pit schools against each other. Great, thank you. So um, I'd like to just take um, the time to thank our three panelists for, par par for, pardon me, for participating in today's webinar. Um, you know, uh, on behalf of the ASBNB, we're so grateful for your time um, and your efforts in uh, putting together this webinar and participating. Um, I'd like to also take the time to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Um, you know, we really hope that you have found this webinar to be very helpful as you're thinking about your career. Um, I'd also like to point out that the ASCMB has a number of career resources available on our webpage. Uh, we provide professional development programs um, based on express graduate student and postdoc needs. Um, and, we will be hope, and we hope you'll be able to take the time to fill out a short survey about this webinar um, after it concludes. This survey will be available on meeting exit and via email you'll receive at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, completion of the survey will earn you a code that provides a discount on graduate student or associate ASBNB membership. Uh, thank you again for applying uh, and have a Later wonderful on. day.